Okay, welcome everybody to the Houston Pearlmongers meeting, August 14th, 2024. We're going to be jumping right into discussing Pearl 540, which is the latest major release. If uh, bear with me, I will share my screens. There we go. Okay. Um, I did not do any kind of pre-gaming for this other than I did read through the, uh, the Pearl doc. But uh, the, the the class keyword came out in 538. Is that when it was uh, first put I out? I think so. Under? It, it was the last most recent thing. Okay. So under experimental, uh, this is this is the Corinna project. And uh, this is an example of a class. And I'm just going to use go by this example here. But basically, it is, I guess, an alternative to using packages or to using Bless or to using any of the, of the um, uh, utilities out there, the Perl modules that will objectify a hash. What I, I like to use a lot is util H2O, but this is, this is mainly for people who, I guess, uh, want to write it in a more formal way. And it's good. You know, I, I, I don't usually do formal OOP in my programming, but it's nice that Perl, I guess, formally can formally support yet another paradigm since it supports other paradigms like procedural or functional uh, or what have you. So it's, it's nice that you can throw it in the mix, but the, so this is an example here of a class and I guess it's typical of a class, the class keyword, class name, fields, are going to be your, I guess you could think of those as your hash key members that you would normally bless. Now the, and then the subs here define the class methods. Um, although I don't know what the difference between a method here, there's subs and then no, there's No, I think those subs are something different. Maybe they're private and methods are public. I'm not for sure on that, uh, to be honest with you, but there is a difference between sub and method. It's something like that. Okay. Um, and I think that, that, when I learned object-oriented stuff in school, they they called the fields um, data members, but I think that also in Perl or other language, they're commonly called properties, the data members of an object or the properties of an object, or in this class, they call them fields, whatever. But yeah, they're, they're called properties in most other common, like I originally started out labeling them as data members in the compiler, and then I changed it all to say properties when I noticed that most other modern languages were saying properties. So I the see. fact that they're using fields here is a little bit whatever in left field, but we all know what it means. So here's the, okay, so method methods are subroutines intended to be called in the context of the class. Oh, okay. In other words, it automatically sends the first argument as a as a link to to as a reference to the um object itself so you don't have to do myself equal shift every time i guess like in the olden days Subclass. that's my assumption uh it sounds right to me um i'm trying to see if there's so that's one example of a sub so the one example of having sub uh, sub keyword in here is they're saying you can override, you can have subclasses to override this method with different behavior. So well, that's interesting. That doesn't explain what we just saw. 
that's a different usage of sub. It does. Yeah, it does not. I mean, okay, well. There's we'll no explanation as to why that's done that way. Mohammed just made this code up himself, I assume. I'm going to try and run this. Can you see my terminal? Uh, yeah. He may be awake in the middle of the night. Sometimes he gets insomnia. I'll send him a message. Who's that, Muhammad? Mm-hmm. Okay. Hey, yeah, that would be cool to get him to join. All right. So Once we're gonna... in a while, he's awake. It's London. It's late for him, but he surprises me sometimes. So field X. Oh, this is interesting. So field is calling this. So the dollar oh, that's class... where default X and default Y are coming in because they're being called by, as some initialization for those fields. Yeah. It's a little so, bit contrived, but I'm assuming he's trying to show some parts of the new idiom. So it is internal. Yeah, it, those would be like private um, methods if you want to use it or private, uh, uh, what do they call them? Member functions, I think, in C++, something like that, where that it's not for everyone outside to use. It's only for inside to use. And this, and this, this, this other class example two inherits from example one yeah. and then redefines the default X. Okay. Yeah. So you can save probably half a dozen lines of code by doing it this way, but you give up control over what you're doing. So it's it's whatever. It's it's a syntax sugar thing, I guess. Although it, it goes a bit beyond that because they are supposedly making some of these changes to reflect things internally to the interpreter. So um it, it's it's probably it does not create the same op tree as blessing your own hash and doing this the old way would do this right. there's like a new op tree for the class keyword and a new op tree for the method keyword i think yeah like Except a whole like new that. data type in the interpreter i think there is an mm, i think there may be a new data type ov maybe i'd have to look i'd have to look okay well um in any case the uh I wish I wish there was an example of like what you would do instead of using class or maybe. Oh, I see what you what's going on here. So this allows you to more easily subclass. So this class keyword, like if you're if you're writing a package, you can use under double underscore package, double underscore in your code. And when you subclass it, that'll that'll it's basically a macro that translates to your child, the subclass name. So you don't have to rewrite a bunch of stuff. And then so that avoids hard coding is what it does. Yeah. So if you were to put in, you wouldn't put like example one here. This just takes the name. You of could whatever. put that. Yeah, you could, put you that. could because, th but then it would all be hard coded. So but you'd have to redefine it, it here. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it, it does allow you to not keep re hard coding things that are inherited. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, this is all because you're using their new paradigm anyway. Like you you could achieve all of these same things using the normal bless operation. It would just take a few more lines of code. Right. But right. you could still create default values, methods, you know, redefining something in a subclass. All of that stuff already existed, which leads me back to something I didn't want to interject within your first 10 seconds. But... Perl has always supported object-oriented programming. It's just that it was a very primitive operator of bless, where you had to then build up your own methodologies of, of object-oriented programming, whereas this is a pre-canned version where you don't have to use the primitive bless operator. You can use their corned beef hash instead. I yeah, I, I need to find it where I read this, but I read in some much older books uh, that Pearl doesn't, and it was by like Tom Christians, Christensen, 
or somebody like that talking about how Perl doesn't support object oriented programming. It supports you building your own object system, basically. And I think which that's... is like a niggling difference of someone's opinion in wording, you know, that's like. Yeah, because we, people people would would use it idiomatically just to get like exactly what they needed out of it, like accessors or some kind of inheritance. I uh, think that what his point was that it needed more fleshing out than what it had currently. But it, it you know, it, it's it's splitting hair is to say, well, does Perl support object oriented programming or does it only support building an object oriented programming system? Well, both. I mean, once you build your own, now it supports it, right? Uh, well, I, and, I don't know. And all Bless does is it attaches a namespace. A namespace to which a is data. Like a, with string, like a literal string. Like when you call when you call something with the with the arrow syntax, it that all that's doing is it's automatically placing in at the very head of the parameter list the string name of the package literally that's what you or doing. that's for calling class methods for calling object methods it passes a reference to the object oh yeah with well self self is a reference to the object for object oh i'm methods. thinking yes you're right i'm thinking class of methods the, and object doctor. methods are called differently class methods accept the name of the class and operate in a generic way across all objects. That's object methods point. accept a reference to the object itself and thus have more specific behavior to that instance of an object. Right. So when you're calling, like you have a new constructor, when you, and you call new it like is an, module, as a class method, module, you, you have the module name. That's like a class foo, method. Foo bar new. That's going to send in the string of the package name. Yes. When you call whatever, you, whatever you, when you, and you bless it, you return to bless reference. Then when you call what, bar arrow, whatever, now that's an object method and it's re passing a reference to the ah, object. Okay. I, I never, I never differentiated between the two, but um, I had to because I built the compiler. Yeah. So I had to know exactly how all of this worked and then actually make it compile. Yeah, so that, I'm that very, makes... very opinionated about this far more than I'm letting on right now because I've already <laughs> done all this work in the past and they're just now catching up and everyone's like, oh, good job. And I'm like, you motherfuckers, I did this 15 years ago and you sons <laughs> of bitches are trying to then get my gun. Benny, get my gun. She's not even here, but I'm telling her anyway, <laughs> just for the record. Well, sorry. We can, you we said can you didn't say want that. any opinions. We can say that because we're all in Texas, right? Um, but no, I that that actually make that that clears up uh, a little bit of uh, fuzzy fuzziness for me. So that's cool. Uh, um, all right, all right then. Well, so like that class arrow default y that that's a that's a call to a class um, method because it's passing the name of the class as a string um, as the first argument. Uh, although it's not actually used explicitly no, here because it hides not, it, but it's there. It's not creating an instance. It well, down here it instance. is. Down here it is, but that's that's in a different thing. Well, yeah, you don't have to use a class method to create a new object. You could use it again is, for uh, lots of generic This purposes. is the chaining. This is chaining. That so, is chaining. So yes. this is the class class. Call and this the is first the... one is a class method call. The second arrow is an object method call. Yes. Okay. Very good. Cool. Um, John, I don't, I don't know if we can answer any. Well, maybe uh, Will can. But did you have any comments or questions on the this? Have you been, have you been playing around at all with the, uh, the Corinna, the the class keyword? No. Okay. Very good. Okay, well, let's see. Um, so we'll, we'll jump to number two, this reader attribute for field variables. All right, with the introduction- Did you try and run that? Did you run it and I just missed that? This one? I saw you pasted it. No, the Oh, yes, one. I'm sorry. Yeah, let me run that. You pasted it, but then I didn't see it run. There okay, so it it's does- Pretty, pretty, pretty jiffy there. 30 and three. And yeah. what was it? Oh, it was supposed to be showing you the default values. 
So the first one, so example one, um, it's got default values. Oh, example it sums two, up X and Y and then one yes. and two. Okay. For example two, you're just, all you're doing is replacing these initializers and not- With a subclassed version. Which is an example of where this class thing comes in here. It it's, is. The field okay. definition is is able to to be applied. I I guess it's it, it, it's almost like a template type thing. You know, there is one thing that is valuable to learn from all of this that actually applies to us, Brett. And I was thinking about it earlier today. And I don't think it's too far afield to mention it because um, the the reason why I initially agreed to to philosophically support this class system was because the bad guys, and you know who they are, were saying that they would um, be reasonable about adding the data type system after this was done, which was a lie. You know that they that's their MO, okay? If they're talking, it's a lie. So um, that's fine. I know that now. We all know it. But I was trying to be moving forward in good faith. And I said many times, and you can go watch all the old episodes of Pearl Town Hall that I mentioned, Corinna, and it's always tagged in there. You can see right in the thing. And I said, yes, I'll, I'll accept this. And by accepting them, I will implement this into the Perl compiler, which will take a significant amount of effort from my myself um, if we can have working data types. So fast forward, you and I had that whole debacle where we got a nice reminder of how terrible everyone is in P5P is all bad guys, except for the very limited ex example of Dave Mitchell being kind of a neutral guy. Like, he's not really one of the bad guys. He's not really one of the good guys either. Okay, like, he seems to be pretty neutral, actually. Um, and and uh, so, so the reason I bring up Dave is because one of the critical things, probably the most important thing that he said, there were se several interesting things that he said, like, they, they, they're not going to accept any more distributions into the core distribution, any more um, modules into the core distribution. The because dual life. Yeah, dual life, because it forces the Perl 5P maintainers to now become the maintainer of someone else's crap, which, yeah, I mean, that no one wants that, right? I, I totally understand that. Um, so his, <laughs> his, his, his one salient point that directly relates to what we're looking at here and that I think we have no choice but to seriously can understand and consider and that I'm going to have to do something about is um, in order for a data type system to be considered legitimate, even the first step of legitimacy, the parsing part of the type system, which is not a lot, but it's not a little bit either. It's a medium amount of work. It has to check every argument for every subroutine. So you have to parse every sub and method and every argument in every sub and method to check and make sure it's the right data type. That's, that's how data types work. And that I have working using this crazy thing that's like a source filter. And we know that they won't allow that because Dave Mitchell specifically it, said, we'll never allow anything like that. And, he, and I don't know if you remember this, but he said, if you want to be taken seriously, you have to implement that parsing stuff directly in the op tree. Right. Did you see, uh, did you ever get around to watching, or you were there, Damien Conway's talk at the conference. I was there in person. Was any yes. of that, so like the signature checking, was any of that applicable at all? I don't really think that we'd be able to utilize it directly, but I would probably start by trying to look at that code so we can like crib some of their code to just bootstrap ourselves and make it easy. It's always easier to copy and paste something that's similar and then start changing stuff than yeah. to try and write it from a blank piece of paper. So I would probably, and the reason is because if their thing is doing something with, subroutine arguments then that may be in the right direction of where we would need to go well i, I don't and i don't remember i need to go back and watch it actually because nothing that he showed was i critically impressed with 
So there was nothing, there was no magic bullet that he presented that would solve this problem for us. In okay. fact, the vast majority of what Damien does is totally outside of the interpreter. It's pure parole stuff. Right, right. It's just and him being super crazy with ultra high magic code. I'm trying right? to it's remember like a, even if a regex is... that parses, a regex that generates a grammar that parses all the pearl or something. You know, like, gee whiz, that's a bit too much, man. So yeah, I, I, don't, to, I don't, I don't, I didn't see, see him. It. It, I need to go back Unfortunately, it. it's, it's really the bad guys that are closer to this stuff right now. All of this new Corinna crap is closer to what I'm talking about than anything Damien was doing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if was, that answers your question. It does. But I was, the reason I asked it was because it, you mentioned checking the parameters. And I don't remember if he used some a for, source filter or not. I don't remember either. You're, you got me on that one. But you're right because the, and that's another really annoying and almost infuriating thing is these, the, um, subroutine, uh, signatures, which is such a fake feature. That it, and I know some people use it, and they actually there is functionality. Well, this for him, this was in context of the 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 smart matching, where you can. Oh no, no, it was the multiple dispatching that he talked about, where you can right. have a subroutine that has it's def, it's defined several different ways with different different parameters, and then Perl the Perl would just figure out which one you actually wanted to call. And and that and you know that is correctly solved by actual subroutine arguments not by these fakey signature things the reason why signatures is even it. exist is because the pearl type system is hidden and made unavailable to its users and the only thing you can access is fake signatures so by 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 un by jailbreaking the already existing data type system, which is what I'm doing, it, it renders signatures completely, I wouldn't say obsolete. I, I would just say e even, I, well, yeah, I mean, like worse than obsolete, like harmful even. Because if you tried to use subroutine signatures instead of arguments, you would be shortchanging the interpreter and it wouldn't be able to correctly identify all the data types i guess mm -hmm. so it would it would fall squarely into the fake category which i've been harping on so much fake data types are fake and should be derided and real data types are real and should be praised and not very many people seem to understand that other than the few that have watched my talks i guess but if you go back and watch both of my intro to Perl data types talk, that is the point of the in, both of those entire talks. What is fake and what is real? And yeah. signatures are completely fake and arguments are real. So we've, we're going to have to probably, like you said, maybe look at what the, the code is that, that allows signatures to parse through the op tree and see if there's any way we can copy some of that to parse through arguments instead. And if there is, then all I have to do is rip out all my stupid source filter and replace it with an Optree parser. And boom, I mean, we have something that now Dave Mitchell is going to have a way harder time shooting down. They'll still do it. They'll still find 100 reasons because COVID's making them. And I don't mean the disease, although maybe I do. But... Uh, you know, there's different sizes of diseases. Some of them are macroscopic. Um, so yeah, that that it's uh <clears throat> they will find other reasons not to want to do it. Uh, but but that's that that was the only legitimate reason out of all the crap that they can come up with. I am forced to accept that because it's right. Source filters suck. And the one that I wrote is insane. And no one, even me, can barely understand it. And it's got like four lines of comments for every line of code. I mean, it's like, oh boy, I need to delete this code someday because it's so bad. And once we once we have an op tree parsing thing, then then I can. And we'll have a real data type system finally. So anyway, but you said you didn't want opinions. 
Did I say that? I don't even remember. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> I, I talk too much and erase your memory. Buffer uh, overflow. Sorry. Stack overflow. Yeah. There you go. Stack overflow. There you go. <laughs> um, cool, cool. All right. We're gonna jump into the uh the reader attribute. So okay, cool. So he's got an example in, in version 538 with the experimental key, uh keyword class. Um so wait. For the introduction to O stuff, this is how you create a class. Okay, if you notice the name met notice the method name, get age is just a generic getter. Luckily, in the latest release, the same can be achieved with just using colon reader without having to explicitly notice. Okay, so that's gonna delete some more some more uh, boilerplate. All right. So for the record, getter and setter are um are the object-oriented methods used to read and write um, data members or fields as they're called here, which are usually protected and not allowed to be edited externally. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they have many other different names as well. Um, uh, what is the, uh, they- So they... Here's, here's the example where you, you're, you're just getting the value. Now, if you wanted the setter, so I was wondering about what the setter, because the setter is actually going to accept the parameter that you're going to update the Accessors value and mutators. That's okay. the actual academic term. Gitter and setter is like a colloquialism that is a day class A thing. It's maybe more commonly used, but it makes you sound a little bit, eh. Lower class. That's fine. Like it. OOP dilettante. There you go. <laughs> um, he, I was wondering about the setter, and he, uh, Muhammad addresses this. Not yet, but we, he's hoping that we get this. Oh, next oh, I'm sure they're already experimenting with it. And these are all just like all of this stuff is shortcuts for things that we already had. Yeah. Right. So that what they're going to do, the, the, it's pretty clear what their um, their sort of uh, uh, methodology is to to keep creating shortcuts for the things that we already had working. And then once you have a whole bunch of syntax sugar in place, then you can claim that you've created a whole new system when you've really just created a bunch of short like moose and moo and all of them. They already have shortcuts for all this crap and have for a long, long time. It's just wasn't in the op tree. Oh, yeah. Good point. All right, we're going to... Did you paste it? You yeah. shouldn't have to say use experimental class for 540 unless it's using some new... Oh, because the reader it's... thing is experimental. Is no, that what it is? I think class is still experimental. Class itself. I don't think so. Yeah. In 540? I think so. Try it without it and see if it works. Okay, let me try the, I'll try the, um, this is the 538 code. Without the experimental. Oh, you're right. It is still, I think, you, it, I think you're right. It's just the class keyword underscore underscore class. Yeah, class is not. That they added. The lower score class thing is still experimental. Okay. My bad. I got confused between class and the class keyword and the class keyword. So <laughs> sorry for, for that. Um, Some might consider that to be an understandable mistake. Okay. So this is the old code. Well, the 538 code. This is with the... See, I've never, I've never uh, used attributes before either. All right, so I'm going to call this just employee two. Yeah, there you go. Now you see the problem with what we're doing here. Oh wait, I don't need this. Oh wait, yeah, I do. No, no, I don't need that because I have enough. No, you don't need both of those again. It's just repeating the same boilerplate thing. No. Uh, the problem with this type of programming 
is that it's starting to get into something that is maybe not the same as, but getting closer to a meta object protocol or MOP, which is what Moose and other high magic class what systems provide. Is that so you could have, you could, this is, this would be considered even too low level. So a meta object that... protocol essentially allows you to um, modify. It allows you to do a few things. It allows you to modify the way that the class, um, uh, the object oriented platform itself works. So it's like a way of changing how Moose itself functions, which certainly is a complicated thing because if you start changing the way that the OO system itself works, then everything under that starts changing in, in weird, unpredictable ways. Um, so that's one thing that MOP lets you do, which is probably not a good idea. Another thing that high magic MOP heavy type OO systems allow you to do, and what we're starting to see here, is um, instead of using an object-oriented system to contain procedural code, which is sort of the normal way of doing things, like inside of a... Of a, of a method, you should be able to read that code kind of like it's procedural code, like normal seeming code, okay? But once you start adding a whole bunch of special keywords that are specific to the class or object oriented system, such as reader, param, or, or whatever these other new little, um, what do you call them? attributes? Uh, Oh. Now, what you start seeing is you're writing less and less procedural code and more and more sort of meta object code. And That's to make a long story I short, it doesn't I, end well. It doesn't I end can't, well. Uh, I can't work with uh, moose heavy code because it just doesn't even look like Perl to me. You can't even understand what it does. Hey, everything's... Yeah, it's like everything. everything is an attribute and the few little bits of executable code are buried as some anonymous sub in a weird attribute in a subclass somewhere. None of the code is coherent and there's nowhere at all that you can look and see one page of code and actually read it and understand what it does. It defeats the purpose of writing source code. Yeah. I, that's why I, I when I was at cPanel, uh, we would uh there was there was a, well, at least one guy who he would wrote all his stuff in moose and throw it I in would, the trash can i would always dread well and unfortunately we couldn't cuz it made money it was like you know in a critical in a critical path but the uh the problem was whenever i needed to go modify it or deal with it i would sit there i'd have to sit there for 2 days and figure out what the heck's going on because it didn't even, I didn't even feel like I was working in Perl. Perl is already a overly abusable language for obfuscation. And that's the subject of an entire section of my academic paper. When you add a meta object protocol on top of that, it, it makes an insufferable language into a needs to be deleted language. And this is me talking about Perl, the king of Perl promotions. Okay. <laughs> So Moose is not bad. The meta object protocol that Moose allows people to abuse is bad. Perl is not bad. The multiple, multiple ways that you can write obfuscated code that allows people to abuse Perl is bad. Mm -hmm. So don't hate the sinner, hate the sin or something, I guess. Um, but you... You need to understand what the culprit is, right? The culprit is not object-oriented programming. The, cul the culprit is meta-object protocols and the attempt to displace procedural programming with object-oriented programming. So when I was in college, the way that they taught us to write code was first you learn how to write one line, one page of code that's all procedural code. Then you can start putting things into subroutines. And then when you're really smart, you can start putting things into classes. 
I think, but you I, don't, you don't do, you don't start with everything in a class and then try and learn it backwards. But I think that's what happened to some young programmers. They never learned how to write good code. They only jump straight into Moose or something. That, that or made maybe, me think that that probably the ultimate goal is to be able to do this, turn this into an application. <laughs> Java has an entire subsystem that allows you to use UML diagrams to write code. And the code that it creates is the worst, most boilerplated, templated code that you can't even tell one page from the next because it all looks identical. Uh -huh. It looks identical. So it, again, defeats the purpose of writing source code at all. So what we're seeing with this new version where you've got a reader and a param and a whole bunch of new keywords and things that make it so you don't need to write a lot of procedural code anymore. I'm telling you, that's bad. It's actually, and oh, wait, you didn't want opinions. Keep forgetting. Sorry. This is a pretty qualified opinion because you can clearly see how bad Moose makes things. And then you can look at what they're doing and you can clearly see that they're driving this straight off the cliff, just like Moose did. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's, and that was always my argument against using Moose is a lot of people focus on memory that can always be improved. I always just, like I said before, my issue was it wasn't Perl. I wasn't working in Perl. Like it was just so obfuscated, like you said. Uh, it it's just, what you're reading is meta object code, not yeah, Perl code. Exactly. Well, good. And, I'm, and I'm I didn't I'm sign up to be a meta object programmer. That's right. not my job or profession. There you go. So there that's you. what now, now you maybe have an even better idea of why I resist these bad guys. Cause they're trying to turn us all into mop programmers. This, this should be alarming to anyone who appreciates co readable code. So when some so when somebody is saying in a conversation online or in person, when are we going to get a mop? That's what they're asking for. They want to be Good able Lord, to do- Good Lord, those people should be shot. <laughs> they, that, they're, they're asking for the ability to do meta programming. Meta object protocol. Meta that's what object. mop stands for. And, and it basically them... means unreadable bullcrap code. That's exactly what it means. And that's, and the, now, so if you go and read my paper, I go on a whole long rant about why, why people are able to abuse Perl to get better job security because they can make their code unreadable and then no one can ever maintain their code. And MOP is the new job security. It's the new modern version of absolutely bullcrap, unreadable code that no one can ever maintain again. And now you're unfireable. You're going to die. You're going to take the whole corporation down with you, and they'll finally delete your Perl code when you die and replace it with some non-Perl language. I Instead of know. helping the corporation to slowly upgrade that code to better Perl code while you're still alive. So when you die, it can go to another younger Perl programmer and they can keep Perl in their corporation. Well, so yeah, we cPanel tried to delete Perl and all they ended up with, with was Perl plus a whole bunch of integrations with other third party cloud systems. <laughs> not, not now I'm talking internally, not the main product, which is but, even worse than what you had before. Yeah, and that's where we that's where we had a lot of the, the the moose, or I guess maybe they used moo, or there is is there another one? Yes, there's a whole bunch of them, but Not you can mouse. use you can use moo and moose together, and moo by default does not enable the mop, but once you touch a part of the code that triggers the mop then Moo magically upgrades your code to Moose without you even knowing it. Ah, didn't know that. So that's why people are like, Moo is like the gateway drug. Isn't that what they call it? It, it gets you addicted to something that's far worse than you ever could have imagined. Right. It, there's the illusion that there's constraints to it, but there's not. It's the end of your career as a Perl programmer and the beginning of the bullcrap career as a mop programmer janitor 
you might as well become a janitor and flush the rest of your career down the toilet. Well, there's more dignity in mopping a bathroom floor, it sounds like. I I can't disagree with you there because personally, I, I don't think I would accept the job as a meta object programmer here, versus here. taking a job as, as a janitor. I would actually do that and just work unpaid, which is hey, what I've been doing anyway. I so, worked as a janitor at a Gold's Gym in college just for the membership. Hey, there you go. And you can take that full bucket of mop water with one arm and, yeah, and like, then the soggy mop with the other hand, you know, and uh, the babes will rush to you. Obviously, I haven't I haven't seen the inside of a gym in many years. So mm, you just stand outside and exercise there in the parking lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like it, I've uh, got my weights right here next to me, man. Where's it? The I, beach gyms in California where they work out outside. Yes. And they're <laughs> sweating the whole time, I'm sure. But uh Anyway, please, please go on. My my okay. comments know no ends. Uh, John, just jump on in here if you want. Um, but I'm going to move on. So here's something that I think that everybody would uh, would think is cool. And I've also wondered why in the heck it was always like this. But a space is now permitted using the dash capital M command. Which yeah, because nice. it always looks like it's the name of a module that has an uppercase M as the first letter. And if you have to use a module that has an uppercase M as the first letter, then it's gonna be dash M M something. So it it is definitely strange to have that cuddled with no space. And I will agree that's something that should have been done like 20 years ago. <laughs> It's such a trivial thing. Why do we need to care about this? It's because there's nothing else to oh. care about, you know? There we go. Uh, what am I doing? No oh. language, no modern language should have go. to advertise a change in its <laughs> command line argument processing. That's kind of belittling or like well, uh, degrading to a language, right? So this is the old, this is the, 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 traditional way and now let's see it work boom it worked now i think it might be the end end of an er era uh because people used to write their like these y dot pm modules and i recently saw somebody has written an e module so oh continue. really oh yeah that's true some guy did create a crazy catch-all e module and i was yeah. like why did he do that but now you're making me <laughs> use all me i know off. is <laughs> it's an abuse of a stupid thing that's not supposed to be a feature. And that's why people hate Pearl, because we do stupid crap like that. Yeah, and he's supposed to uh, implement beast mode. I don't know. He's apparently he's going to be writing it. And, uh, and what admin. exactly may I ask? Not that I'm a professional lifelong programmer or anything. What exactly is beast mode? Let's see. Hmm, I wonder, is it something that he just made up? Almost certainly. Is it something that we need to care about? Probably not. But yes, I did see that. And in fact, I might have even mentioned it on a recent Pearl Town Hall. It, it's some, it's yet another person's personal preference module, right? That like sets everything up the way that they like it in Pearl. And it has like no value or meaning to anyone else, I guess. There's there's a lot of that sort of thing out there. This is it. Oh. No, that's not it. That's John. That's J Nap. Oh, this is it. Programming like a beast. There we go. E. Uh, oh H. boy. <laughs> it's E. E. Beast mode unleashed. Edit trace. Use E. Watch subs. Yeah, it, it's it's his personal preference module that allows him to set up some stuff the way that he likes and. Maybe somebody else will use it. Maybe not. Pearl. Is it something that I would promote to someone to use? Probably not. Because what does it mean? It's, it, it, it's again, it's somebody's personal thing that they made up, essentially. He's, well, he made his own clone module. No, he's just making a shortcut to storable clone, you know? He made his own UTF. No, he just made a shortcut to UTF. Okay. Okay. So 
That's fine. Well, that's why, like, in I wrote an extension to Util H two O called Baptize, but underneath it just uses Bless. So I thought you were gonna make a joke that it was like dash E Baptize, so it was like Baptize Me or something, but uh, my should, my Baptize write, or whatever. I should have that. Uh, I'll do something. Please don't use Beast Mode <laughs> if that's okay with you. Well. So the reason I brought that up is to just point out wait, sorry. that there is actually a dash M E thing. That's this guy is abusing to look yes. cute and yeah. don't do that. And also while you're at it, don't create Perl modules that are a single lowercase letter ever just because it's well, dumb and when confusing. People would write Y, Y dot PM. It would always just be locally. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and when I accessible. saw this guy release it onto CPAN, I was like, what is he doing? <laughs> I thought that they might actually like ban him for doing that or something, but I guess not. Heck, no, if they it's... can't ban me for grabbing integer, then I guess they can't ban him for grabbing Yeah, I was e. going to say, it's not like he grabbed, uh, you know, standard data types. Keywords. Uh, uh, uh. It's not like he wrote a compiler or something. I'm going to rename the compiler into feast mode. And so anytime anyone uh, wants to compile something, I'll tell them to run it in feast mode. Or maybe I'll make some fresh bread and I'll run it in yeast mode. <laughs> I don't know. I've, but sometimes when I have to go back and visit uh, Benny's homeland, it's in the far east mode, you know. <laughs> but anyway. Sorry. Maybe maybe have it uh, have, have the obligatory ASCII art uh, banner that gets printed. By Believe default. it or not, I did create one in that pod that I mentioned for my book so that when you viewed the HTML, it had the full JPEG graphic. But when you viewed it in a man page, it showed the same graphic in ASCII art. So I actually did did do that already. And I did it years before the beastie dude. Mm, he should beastie. start a new pro programming club called the Beast Mode Boys. And he can, you know, it's it's pretty cool. They make a as lot. As long of as he has his own own logo, he has to fight for his right to party. That's right. All right, very cool, very cool. Um, so yeah, that's pretty straightforward. The I'm gonna new... create an Oron. I'm gonna create an O R O N dot P M, so I can do a dash M Oron <laughs> code. Um, or whenever these the bad guys are talking about it, I'll make a. a a lowercase y, uppercase a, lowercase ass, so that they can, you know, kiss the dash m with the other stuff following it after there. So, yeah. We we should keep that and abuse it as much as possible. It's very uh, ripe for abuse. This is true. Yes, it is. It sure is. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Dear. Okay. So, moving along, uh, we have the new uh, double caret logical xor operator this is the only feature that makes any sense well there's one coming up that i that i'm well it's not a feature it's not a new feature it was de-experimentalized uh, try catch is probably not bad either but the the logical xor is the only thing that actually follows along with the way that Perl has always worked yeah I it guess. was it was nice to see them add some like actual Perlish things uh to this and and then uh the one later on i'm not thinking of try catch but there's that the n at a time thing we'll we'll cover shortly that i think is really exceptionally multiple published. iteration values yeah i really like that one uh and i i didn't anyway we'll go so logical xor let's look at the we had three Give low precedents run, see if it works we had three low precedents uh logical operators and or xor also two medium precedent which and and or, but there was no XOR. I see what they, so they just added the XOR. And I had to program all of this stuff in the compiler, all the precedences, all the arities and all that stuff. So this is a real, like you said, Perlish thing that sort of belongs oh, I see. So, in Perl. Yeah, this is this is a nice, a nice addition. Um, it gets rid of one, two, three characters every time you use it. So... The parens and then one of these, you know, there's two characters versus three. I would probably not chain it all together like that without parentheses because it's harder to read. Oh, true. 
True. But the but the fact that it exists at all is is a good thing because it, it was a missing link, so to speak. All right, giving it a run here. Go. I guess it works. I mean, how hard could it be to implement in core? Just kidding. I didn't say that. There you go. That was probably not too hard to implement because they were able to probably copy most all of it. Yeah, we'll have to. That's true. You can, a lot of this stuff that does get added by people is basically just copying along. And and Paul Evans actually put out a pretty good, I don't know if you would call it a tutorial, but like how to add a keyword. This is before all his modules that were. I remember. Yeah. It was when he was working on object pad, I guess. Yeah. All right. Well, that's cool. So um, I guess I just want to highlight this. So everybody knows that there is now an XOR high precedent logical operator that is joining and, and then or. All right. Try catch is no longer experimental. Okay, that's cool. I don't really use that. Um, I, I've i used that maybe in a few cases, but typically what I'll do is I'll just do the standard. Um, Wrapping a die in eval. Or yeah, like and uh, you know, make sure you localize the dollar at, but, but I, I've still, I, what, what I really this is probably better than eval and die because it's less magic. So I'm <laughs> right. cautiously optimistic that this may be better for Pearl. Yeah, I'm not against it at all, and in fact, the the biggest compliment I can give to try catch is that looking at its source code is what taught me how to how to get crazy with prototypes and that led me to to create two different modules that I could not have done without using prototypes because under underneath it all underneath it all try tiny is actually not that complicated or big of a module uh, it's really just doing some things with prototypes is this is this actually using try tiny yeah. The new thing, the new try catch thing? I think so. Oh. Or is it implemented directly? I don't know. That would be confusing if it was a re-implementation. Let's see. I don't know. Uh try catch feature. The try feature. I mean it doesn't mention try tiny anywhere. I, you I, might be I, right. I might be totally, totally uh, confused here. Well, totally it, it wrong. may be that was again like Object Pad, some sort of play playground for them to experiment with. But I don't see anything in the new Try Catch documentation about Try Tiny. And the reason I was kind of surprised when you said that was because of the thing again with Dave Mitchell saying they won't accept any new thing, any new. Dual life. Well, try. I thought try tiny was already in the core. I don't know. But well, maybe it's not. Okay. Well, I apologize for the confusion. Um. Yeah. I. I it looks like you're correct because there's no. Yeah. There's no try. Ti try tiny may have just been a uh, trial balloon for the syntax. And there you go. Okay. Well, that's nice. And so the, 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 okay. So you don't, you just have to do use V five, four, zero to get it or, or starting, where does it say? Starting with 34, 5.34, you'd have to use experimental try. Okay. Cool. So I guess, before that, if you're using before 30, 534, you would have to use try tiny in that case if you wanted to use that syntax. But I wonder, I'm not going to try it right here, but possibly they did it so that if you use try tiny in 
pre. I, I think the syntax is very close for yeah. matching. If it's not exactly the same, it's probably super close. I mean, it looks correct. What I wish, what I wish they would actually do is have a um, a way to dispatch the catches based on error type. So, like, I if you, know. so, like, if then try tiny. If if you use die to say throw throw a uh, die can throw a a reference to like a class or something. And that's what uh class was a class exception is a way to build out exceptions. And you, you, when you, instead of saying die, you throw them. And so you can actually, let me pull it up. Cause this. I, I probably use this in the past uh, too much. Is it exception class? No, it's quick. Zoom, I'm sorry, you can't see it. Zoom's bar is getting in the way here. Let me move it over. No, we okay. can't see that. Uh, no, this is, is this it? No. Uh, you see that? Is Jacques, is Jacques de Guest? Yep, I've been talking to him. Exception class. Okay. So here we use this a lot at cPanel and some older code, but basically you define a uh, your exceptions, and it's kind of like a, I guess a meta meta ish way of programming it. But then you would throw it. You would actually th use throw, but it, what it really was is a die, and so the it would throw this class that it constructed, this class instance it constructed from this information. Like if you wanted to throw, which one is thrown here? Just the gen general exception class. Oh wait, no. Yeah, my exception. So it's throwing this one, which is a generic exception, but it's a reference. So it blesses it and it, I guess gives it some default fields. And so um, when, you can catch it within an eval or within the try here. And then here, the example is even using try catch. Now with, with try catch, what I was saying is if you have something like this and you wanted to use uh, this try catch, some, some languages, I think JavaScript might actually have uh, this syntax where you can put multiple catches and the catch would it's like multi dispatch catch where mm. like this catch would catch one type. You'd have another catch that caught another type, but within here, what you actually would have to do is you're getting this. This is the, whatever gets thrown here, this dollar E. And then within it, you would have to do your checking rather than having just a, a series of catches based on the different exceptions that get thrown. I think JavaScript has this. Their try catch. Let's see, can you do multiple? Actually, that looks like what Perl did, what exactly what JavaScript did. Let's see though. JavaScript multiple exceptions catch. Multiple. Catch box. I don't know what they search for. Multiple catch. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. So like you'd have a catch, mm. but within it you would you would be able to dispatch somehow. And so okay, JavaScript does not have it. JavaScript does not have it. So I guess that's that's probably not a knock on Perl so much since JavaScript doesn't do it. But this is what I'm talking about, where this probably, with the exception of having, I guess you could even make it so that fair word worked, but uh, this is basically what you would have to do in Perl also, where you do the catch, and then within it, you would 
uh, dispatch. But I, I'm trying to think. Um, I don't know what language it was. I mean, it, I don't really. I haven't really ever messed with that many languages, but I seem to recall that something had a multiple catch. Um, can you try a command for me? It's you may not know it. It's called right core here. list. Um, it's it's a Perl application that comes along with the module core list distribution. Just try and type core list one word and hit enter and see if it's installed. Just hit enter. Yeah, there you go. So do core list. Just get out of that core list space dash little v space five dot forty dot o. No, dot o. Oh, dot zero. There you go. Now pipe that through less. Page uh, or page down to see for if try, try tiny? tiny is in there. It's not. Okay. You went too far. No, it's not there. There you go. There's the answer. So when was so? Was it? That's 30... a list of all the dual life um, modules. Okay, it's not even in thirty four or thirty two. I don't think it was in any of them. I guess. I guess. Yeah, I thought. Just... I thought it was funny. They wouldn't have put it in and take it back out again. Correct. Yeah. I don't think. I think that would have been much. Much. Uh, there would have been much to do about that. Yeah, we they would, would have, have broken a lot of code to do that. Okay. All right. Well, you you sent me on a quest to find out about that. So there's the answer. Oh, good. Well, people watching this in the future will be well edified that we we do our research here. Mm -hmm. Houston Pearl Mongers. Of course, we're relying on our Austin research branch. <laughs> I thought you guys were a branch of Austin Pearl Mongers. <laughs> oh, here's a list. Okay. No, we're we're branches of Dallas. Yeah, yeah. They, except that they went to phone. <laughs> um, can you open that thing that 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 John just typed in there? Oh wow! Oh. Someone typed in a, a who just joined the group here. Hello, six eight one two zero eight. What is uh, oh, wow. I I can't. I'd have to unshare. I think to see what John. Oh okay. What can you just tell me and I'll type it. Uh, perldoc.perl.org slash 5.40.o slash modules. And that's a web interface to core list, I guess. perldoc.perl.org slash 5.40.0 slash modules. All right. Oh, okay. Gee whiz, it was prohibitively difficult to find that. Thank you, John. I could not find that. Friggin' online list. Like, Googling for Perl dual life did not bring that up. And core modules did not show that. And core list did not show that. <laughs> I knew there was an online list somewhere because I've seen it before. And Perl does not make things easy sometimes when it should. But, uh, yeah, I guess try tiny is not it. Oh, there is another core list command you can use to search for the module name. What uh, is that? It's dash um dash, dash m. You, you don't even put the dash v, you just type core list space and then try tiny. I think. There you go. <laughs> or so I think. Very confident. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh, okay. That's cool. It's first released. Oh, wow. I didn't realize try, uh, HTTP tiny has been... Do this. Do the long. same command, but for all <laughs> lowercase integer, and you can see how long they've been typo squatting and destroying the, the Perl... Uh, That's in core? Space. Oh, wow. Okay. Since, okay. since the very first release of Perl 5, they have purposefully allowed Arthur Bergman, a useless Perl programmer, to typo squat on that namespace. Doesn't now, he own Archer's Fastly? rich, don't get me wrong, and Does he, he controls own? a ton of Perl people, don't get me wrong, he's worth like $10 million, but that doesn't mean he cares at all about completely cock-blocking all of the type hey, system forever. Family show. Oh, yeah. Are you talking I about rooster, rooster blocking chicken? 
There Nailed was it. a rooster in the field along with a very nice donkey or a sweet ass as we called him. What company does Arthur own? Fastly? Is that yes. correct? Okay. And they can go straight to Heckley as far as I'm concerned. All right. Well, and I actually did ask someone to approach him about it. And he was like, no, we just decided to, to keep that forever. I was like, well, you, you guys are, you're bad guys. I mean, how can you justify that? You know, like, well, we don't want anyone to have access to, to the type system. So we're just going to permanently block it. There, that's why I call them bad guys. Okay, sorry, you didn't want any opinions. What? Did you say that? I don't remember saying that. I I I have the AI button muting. Oh, me. okay, okay, and it automatically generates good ideas. <laughs> I need All to right. get that button. Um. Okay, <clears throat> so that's that's try catch. And then this is, I think this is my favorite here is the, uh, what do they call that? Iterating over multiple values at a time is no longer experimental. I did not even know that this was a thing. I've never used it even once. Um, but I certainly could use it. Uh, so this this is, an, for, in my, for me, this is another example of an actual Perlish update, which is nice. So it lets you uh do what it shows where you can iterate over chunks of chunks yeah of i guess list. that's okay i mean it, it as long as it doesn't get people confused then it seems okay uh, i'm having a hard time well, finding a reason to think it's bad <coughs> right off the bat but what would be nice is to have like this is kind of the inverse of, I think, of uh, the, uh, I forget what you call it, the pearl, array slicing, I mean, the, the 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 hash slicing, where you can actually like you like if you have a hash, you have a hash and then you've got a list of things like an even list of things, and you wanted to put it into a hash with key value, then you would have to actually use the add symbol on the hash name equals and then some other weird syntax on the right hand side of the equal and that forces the hash to be evaluated as an array that that wait a minute let me let me look it up um Zipping. Oh, I bet you util. I think util zip does it. Is it zip? Well, anyway, it takes two. It takes two arrays and it zips them up with the key value. But there's a. Let me look it up. Perl. Uh, combine two arrays into hash. Uh, slice. Unemerge. This is what I'm talking about here. Um, so you're taking. Oh, okay. So you have hash. You declare hash, although it's not using my. But all right, here we go. You've got two lists, and you want to combine them, zip them up into a a hash where you have key value. And then this is, I guess this guy wants to do something crazy because he's got some, I don't know. Oh, I see. He's got some crazy uh, value there. But in any case, this is what the syntax I was talking about where you've declared it hash as a hash, but then you refer hmm. to it as an, with an at. Uh, and then with, you use within the, the uh, you know, curly braces to re you get a you refer to the list of keys, which is the order list from feet, and then it zips it, it matches it one to one with the list of product. Even though this guy is doing something where he's got he's got a reference to a list, so this isn't really a good. This is a little 
this is he's trying to use the standard way to do it, which is this. But I don't be, think I've ever seen that, or if I have, I just kind of blocked it out. <laughs> it would be what I what I would like to see is a, a like some kind of an in fix, like um. Well, let me let me um, let me copy and paste this guy here, and and then show you. Now it may they may have it, um, and there is a. There's a module, Perl module that has like a zip function that I think does this. Uh, in at uh, time.pl. Okay, so we'll run this real quick. And at a time, so it's, well, it's combining them. Let's try this. There we go. Um, okay, so <laughs> what I'm talking about is having like my hash. Well, you you have a uh, list one equals I don't know whatever. I know I don't need to anyway, and then list two. Actually, wait, bear with me here. One, two, three. One, two, three, okay. And then, so you wanna, if I wanted to create a hash that was, uh, that had the, the spelled out one was the keyword and it appointed to one, the integer value, uh, I would like to be able to do something like this where um and this might be how the zip works and then that literally like you can think in your head how a zipper works this is literally doing the zipper and uh there's a language called chapel That has some interesting like things like that. Uh, it's one of those like high productivity HPC languages uh, that was part of a uh, NSF thing in the two thousands. Let's see, where is? There we go. Um, yeah. Here we go. Oh, so it's no, it doesn't do the infix, but it's uh, it does. you could probably use some syntax sugar to make an infix version of it. Yeah, but that's like this this n at a time thing makes me want this kind of thing. Yes. Well, Which you could is, write a little loop to do that, I guess. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Well, you can actually, what you can do, I don't know if you've ever seen this. Um, Toby. Let's try this. I think it's sub infix. Which oh, is. It allows you to call a subroutine with two arguments in an infix. It lets you create, it, it allows you to use Oh, you use these uh, strange special characters to wrap it up. That's funny. Yeah, the only, yeah. Using so, the new keyword thing, you should be able, oh, this was released in 2014. Using yeah, the so, new keyword mechanism, you should be able to do it without those weird characters. Yeah, this was, this was he figured out how to do this without anything special. Yeah, this was pretty um, magic stuff he was doing, probably. I'm guessing it? it's like he, a source filter, maybe. I don't even think it's that. Um, let's see. How does it work? 
you're overloading. You're overload. He's using overload. He had a he had a better write up. Uh, I'm not sure where it was, but basically, um, the compromise was you don't get something as pretty as this, like two plus three. But and you, he was able to do if you had the you know like, I guess characters on either side, he was able to do some magical stuff. Like you said. Well, maybe he'll release a new version someday because Toby Inkster is still an active programmer. Yeah, I've I've always really liked his stuff. Um, very creative and interesting to me. He is. Um, yeah, he just uses overload. He's using overload here, and then doing some some kind of um, has got a turn. Oh, he's overloading the special characters. There That's interesting. Oh I yeah, okay. Thought about that. Yeah. So okay. he's he's creating those as subroutines. That's okay. Yeah. Well, like I said, it was probably some wacky magic thing. So there you have it. Uh, oh boy. Is, is it util set? What is the set? Where do you see set at? Like if I wanted to do set, there's like a standard. There's like a standard module for doing doing set stuff. Oh, you mean data sets? Like sets I, of things, like set operations, like intersection yeah, and union. Yeah. I forget. It's not list utils. Maybe it is. No, I guess not. Maybe. That sounds right. Uh. That's the most standard thing I know of. Okay. It, here we go. Okay, perfect. So this does a zip here. It's got a zip. It is list util. Yes. So this this But it's creating a variable, it's creating an a, a nested array pairs instead of a hash. Oh, let's see. It's not creating a hash, it's zipping two arrays together. Oh, that's crazy. Okay. It's interleaving the arrays like shuffling cards instead of creating a hash. Although I think, and this is kind of what I was thinking about before, is I think you can just force Pearl to switch back and forth between hashes and arrays, and all it's doing is just oh yeah, offsetting things by two to make things into keys and pairs versus in line in a regular array. It is Isn't so you right? can yeah you can you can refer... so you could turn this no you can't turn this because those are sub lists sub arrays you'd have to use a map you'd have to flatten them out and then yeah. map it or something I don't know yeah you you, uh... can, you would map it you would map it get each each reference and then take th those two elements put them together with a com like and then return them return them as a pair. And then on the left hand side of the equal sign, it it needs to be a hash. And then Pearl would put them together. But uh yeah, you can in a lot in, in a lot of cases you can treat hashes and pearl, I mean hashes and arrays like lists or like each other. Because that you know that the arrow or the equal arrow is called the fat comma, also called yes, exactly. the Texas comma. <laughs> uh like. because everything's fatter in texas is that bigger, what you're man. trying to tell me? bigger um but yes that you're right that comma is parsed very similarly <laughs> but not the exact same as a regular comma right it has a different precedence and some, maybe some other stuff so but uh not to get back or let, not to get away from the actual thing we're talking about here which is uh doing the n at a time which is cool. I mean, I think having, I think it should really shine. Let's see what happens when um, we're like, we need three. Um, let's see what happens. So we're going to get three. We're going to get three and then we're going to get one. It's probably going to, oh no, it's, I don't have warnings on, so. 
R S no wait. That's not what I mean. Five, six. Okay, here we go. There we go. Okay. Like you can easily do this uh kind of thing with a hash, but it were having more like having like an odd number or something like this. I don't know. I just really like this because if you're list processing, uh there's like you've got tuples so you got like two tuples like a hash is basically a two tuple but then yes. this opens it up to be any number of tuples like chunks at a time so except again they're not nested sub chunks they're inline correct sub chunks correct but you could do something like uh I know there's a better one to use. I don't know it off the top of my head. This will give you the sub chunks. Mm-hmm. Yep. The nested, prob yeah. nested one. There's probably even a, a fancier way to do it. But um anyway. So that is the end of the article. Um we can jump over to the there was a few other things in the delta, but well, right. I was gonna jump over to the delta and see if there's anything interesting. So this is Perl Delta 540. So basically, uh, Mohammed went over these built-in module. So he didn't go into built-in module. I don't even know what built-in does. Oh, what is the list of built-in modules? Yeah, I didn't look that one up. I don't know what that one does. Pro provides several utilities in the built-in package. These are plain functions. Why? I think this came out... A while back, they were discussing, somebody wanted to add a trim. And in fact, they went through the work and implemented the trim. This is all on P5P. And people, there was a, there were multiple camps, as you, unsurprisingly, about how it was being called. Whether or not, what, like Chomp, if you provide it, it's destructive to the, whatever you, you know, you, the, the, the parameter, uh, it, it modifies it in place. Right. I think the guy had written it uh, so that it returns the new version of the string mm. when and people were, well, they were saying if chomp, chomp modifies it in place, trim you should act like chomp. It should act like chomp. <clears throat> and so there was lots of conversation. And then um, ultimately what it boiled down to was people were like, you can do what you want, but don't pollute the, 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 main namespace of of these um you know the if you want if you want to trim then put either put it in a, a module or put it in a um in a different namespace don't have it just like i guess in main by default and i think this and the reason for that is basically so that people people don't have to use People don't have to use. Um, oh, I know what it was. the The problem was the the for someone else may already have created trim in the past, and it's well, it wasn't. Their it trim. wasn't necessarily trim. It was well. What happens if you want? Uh, 
basically the, the concern was a proliferation of of keywords unqualified keywords and so built in was was the compromise where they can more easily throw in things and not pollute just the unqualified namespace does that make sense Yes, it does. But it seems funny to say, well, this is good enough to be an operator, but we're not going to let it be a regular operator. Right. And then it's kind of like, you know, a uh, second class citizen without really telling us why. Like, right. I would want to know why do these keywords not deserve to be in the main namespace well, the when concern, the other ones do? The concern, excuse me, the concern was that people are just going to start creating new functions for regular expressions like PHP has. And it, and in fact, um, I went and looked up, I'm going to have to search on, uh, let's see, uh, Perl, PHP, string functions. And this is where I discovered PHP. Anyway, there's a there's a Perl module on CPAN. Let me try and find it. It might even be PHP string. Yeah, there you go. Okay. It implements all of the PHP functions. All the PHP string functions, okay? So you can, if you're a PHP programmer, it makes it easier for you to convert to Perl. I guess, I guess. But the funny the funny thing is all of the tests are failing. And I'm not... Oh, <laughs> I'm 130, not, ouch. I'm not exactly sure why. That's like Raygun who got zero points in the Olympics. <laughs> I've never seen someone get a full failure before. I didn't, who is that? What did he, what was his event? Ray Gunn was a female break dancer from Australia who oh. um, fraudulently entered the Olympic contest. Okay. Was not an actual break dancer and just did a, a silly dance on stage, jumping around like a kangaroo and got straight zeros. The <laughs> first person ever. And now, yeah. of course, she's getting investigated because it was a big fraudulent thing. And she actually blocked the real break dancers from being able to compete from Australia, which was bad, really bad. So <laughs> I'll have to anyway, look, yeah, I have not been watching the Olympics. You got to check it out. It's freaking hilarious, I will, man. I will, I will it is it. hilarious. Actually, the, the one thing I, I have been seeing mostly is that Turkish sharpshooter. Oh, I haven't he, seen that. He's he's super casual. Like there's all these like memes where he's just like, he just walked up there with some glasses on. And then meanwhile, they got all the other, uh, the other competitors that they get all this gear on. Like, yes, they look I like did Robo see that. With the... He was able to compete without their fancy crap, basically. Yes. And Everybody that is like... a heartwarming thing to see that, like someone actually relying on their own skill and ability rather than just uh, propped up by a bunch of technical tools. Exactly. Um. Okay. Well, I, I would I could talk I could talk about that all night, but let's move back. Um, so that's so speaking guess, of shooting sports, as of September first, you are not allowed to refer to shooting sports in the Boy Scouts of America anymore. Really, you must now use the totally woke term range and target, range and target. You and you're not allowed to use your own guns anymore either. You have to pay or ammo. You have to pay to buy it from the council. Boom! Ouch! That hurts. Wow. <sighs> ah. And they think this is going to help somehow. Anyway, well, if any, if anybody, uh, if any area of scouting uh, needed protection from getting triggered, I would say it was shooting sports. Uh, John made a comment here about list more utils that okay. has a thing called pair. Well, you need to look, you're going to have to open this link. 
Okay, send it to me. Or tell me, I'll type it in. Uh, or just go to uh, go to pull it up on oh, MetaCPan. You can find Meta the, the module. List more utils. Wow. List colon colon more utils. No, no second colon, no. just the one. Yep. And then go to that and then scroll down to pairwise block. Well, on the right hand side, you can click on it, find it. You can do a search for pairwise. Yeah, there it is. Uh, yes, very nice. Oh, okay. That does look more close to what we were talking about. I do so like maybe the... it was more utils than I was thinking of, but list utils and more utils. Are those released by two different people? Who released this module? Jens. Oh, I've never heard of that Race person Sack. before. Back in 2020? Okay. This it's got a high, high river rating. So a lot of people are using it. Super cool. Oh, wow. Yeah. I uh, yeah. I'm have to look more into this. This is cool. Super cool. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that was a good that? find there, John. It's got binary search stuff. What? Where did I see that? There you go. Searching. Oh, whoa. Binary search. Nice. Now that's cool. Okay. I'm going to have to look. I'm going to have to find a reason. Oh, I won't have to look hard. I'll have reasons to use this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that those list um, modules are, are pretty good. I guess if if you had a, yeah, this would be super helpful for some things. Okay. Awesome. This is getting bookmarked. Brett, while we've been doing this, I've been putting together a list of all the people that have attended Houston Promonger meetings in the last year and a half. Okay. And I'm going to send it to you and I'm going to flog you until you chase them all down. Okay. No, because I, will. I really do not want us to keep meeting with just us. And I know that they're out there because we used to have half a dozen people at every meeting and it was like not always the same people. It was a bunch of different people. So, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. I will, I will chase them down and um, yeah, we'll get some more folks here. I'll, I'll have it done here in a few minutes. I'm still going through the list. You are a machine, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. New built in INF and not a number. So there's an infinity and not a number. Oops. That is useful for for math. Definitely useful. I'm not familiar. I, I've seen not a number plenty of times, like in Fortran code, but I, I don't. I'm not familiar with. I know what infinity is, but I'm guessing if you do something divided by zero, it will give you infinity. And Possibly, if you that's... do something divided by a letter, it will give you not a number, but those are just guesses. Yeah. Those are just guesses. But so this, so I guess going back to the built-in also, the built-in discussion, it's a, it's a catch-all for stuff like this. Um security let's see right past buffer and via illegal user defined okay that sounds like a mouthful pearl for windows binary hijacking vulnerability okay well there was two things two security issues address incompatible changes this might be useful to know reset expr now calls set magic on scalers reset did i Generally, oh, generally used in a continue block at the end of a loop to clear the variables. Hmm. You know, did you know, did y'all know, maybe y'all know about this. Did you know about the uh, redo? Mm -mm. It's like continue, but you, you can redo a loop with, the the variant with the thing that's changing or i guess here it's a while loop 
But if you did like, um, wait, it goes back and like redoes it as if it was that the iteration that you're in. So it's like mm-hmm. literally, you're literally redoing it. Um, so I guess here, oh, this is a net, this is a terrible example. This is a nested. Well, maybe you do need this example, but this is a uh, a redo for standard in. So I, I believe what's going on here is if it hits redo. Oh, is it skipping? It starts to loop block without evaluating the conditional again. Oh, okay. Well, so maybe in this example, it's not che- it's not checking to see if standard in returns something. Actually, I'm not. I'm kind of confused about what I've used it. I've used it um, before to implement actual redo, and it's it's pretty cool. I, and this has been in uh, Perl for a long time. I, I read I read about it in the, the little little camel, you know, the very small um, Perl book, the Perl reference book. But this is oh, this is a triple while loop. Okay, I'm not going to try and figure out what the heck it's doing. But in any case, it's it's pretty cool. Um, it simplified some code I've done before. So that's what reset. I've never used reset. Uh, let's see. Incompat- Those are incompatible changes. That's an internal change. Calling the import method of an unknown package reduces a warning. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Return. Was that not? Oh, okay. So before three eight, I mean, before this would not call, call a warning. In five three nine, this is deprecated and will issue a warning. I can see why it you would probably want to should give a warning. I guess. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, let's see. Return no longer allows an indirect object. What is, I don't even know what an indirect object is. Do y'all know? This is. Some has not been defined unexpectedly parsed as. Oh. So I this don't know one's what that means. I don't even know what this this code does. Neither do I. Oh, this is just a no block. In any case, this says it's unexpectedly parses blob sum. And it won't happen anymore. Or does it warn? I don't know. Uh, class bear, bear words no longer resolved as file handles. So that's good. Oh, this is probably needed for the uh, the class macro, whatever you want to call it. There's a ton of people named William in this list. There's four of us. <laughs> At least, oddly, by far the most common name for recently active Houston Perlmongers people. Um, deprecations. Go to to jump from an outer scope to an inner scope. Oh, that's probably a good idea also. Nope. Performance enhancements. 
negation ops op codes have been modified to support generic. Oh, that's some internal stuff. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Yeah, so op. Oh, PPC. What is that? Is that the parser? I don't know what I'm looking at. I just wanted to see some stuff. I, I can't know. really see it because your font is too small. Oh, well. I just clicked on the GitHub. All right. Uh, let's see. Distribution containing contains a comprehensive set of test tools for writing unit tests. Test more. Wait. It is. Oh, this is test two. Test two suite. It's a successor to test more. Okay. I've heard good things about test two. I haven't tried. Okay. That. So this is interesting because they have added something as a dual life test two suite. Oh, so okay, I good, guess this is call. because they feel like Chad Granham is reliable enough that he's not going to immediately sure. abandon that. But yeah, it is I mean, strange he's... that they're adding that to core, given the previous whining they had about adding stuff to core. Well, I think the well precedent probably is a what you said. Well, it's probably what you said. Plus, a lot of people are moving over to test two. I I haven't used it, but it's supposed to be. That's no reason to add something to the core distribution. Well, I guess I'm implying what I'm implying is that people it, it's it's better. It's it's provably better in a lot of ways. George would probably be George Ball would be able to go over. I've never used test two. Oh, I don't doubt that it's better. I'm just saying the popularity of a Perl module is not supposed to be what drives the decision of whether or not to it, put it. It in may there. also be that test two has Chad and more than more than Chad who can maintain it. It could test be more. I mean, who does? Test more is probably a bit passed through multiple hands. Uh, Chad, oh, Chad is he's got to be the maintainer. He can't be the original guy. Was it? Just click on jump to version in the left side, and it will show you real quick. No, well, yeah, that too, Wait. I guess. But I was going to click the one above it because it has less crap to read. Oh. Oh, jump the version. Okay. Yeah, there's Mueller and GSAR and other people in there. So it's, yeah, it's gone through multiple, multiple. Yeah, Sawyer X was even. So probably, probably just due to the uh, consistency of Chad. So, and, and it's just the, it's just replacing it. Um, yeah, that's what I would, but it is a good point. It was good to point out that they did add that. Uh, here's some updated modules, archive tar, attributes, auto die, B, B, D, parse, benchmark, big, so these are all the already existing dual life modules Yeah, that somebody had to go through and, or multiple people had to go through and update and then test. Yeah, I mean it's that it seems like a lot that's of work. A, an annoying thing, and yeah, I, I personally the whole dual life thing seems to be like a problematic form of favoritism, a technically and socially problematic form of favoritism. That none of these things actually needs to be distributed with Perl, right? And it like I mean, and they don't even they they should call it. I think they should call it what it is, which is the SDK, right? I mean, there's the Perl interpreter and then there's the standard development kit, which is this. Like if, so if you're going to be doing something in core Perl, obviously you need to look up the version, see which, what core Perl means. But like, even like, for example, Ubuntu or Debian, they distribute Perl. Perl comes with the, with the operating system, just like it does in OpenBSD. But I don't know how OpenBSD handles it. But with Debian, 
they only install like the interpreter and then i think a, a subset of these mm, core modules right like they don't even install pearl doc so like if you were to type in pearl doc something it would say you have to you know it would give you the it's not installed maybe look in app get or whatever and so you would actually have to install pearl doc so they they don't they take this and then they break it up however they want it to be which is another problematic thing cuz now you've got a Perl core distribution that's different than other Perl core distributions. Right. And so and now I, it's a double <laughs> game of favoritism because it's the favoritism of the Perl people plus the operating system people. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not sure how how you know tied at the hips they are to to Debian uh or or OpenBSD. But but yeah, and I I'd I'd be interested to I mean I'm curious superficially curious really of what what do these modules actually get distributed with debian because it's not i'm pretty sure it wouldn't be all of them probably just what debian needs so, there's probably a list which somewhere means, debian which means they probably install some non-core stuff too you know they basically just put in what they need for their their infrastructure uh so yeah so documentation changes let's see there is Pearl Guts. Um, Pearl Class, I guess this is a a standard doc that was added when in 3, well, it says 3.8, whenever a class feature was added. Oh, wait, this is use feature. Wasn't it, isn't it use experiment? Or experimental? Where That's a good point. I don't know what the difference is between use feature and use experimental. Yeah, it's experimental. That might be a uh, that might be a pod error. Or, uh, no, it's bug. it's a real thing. Use feature. Well, heck, it's, it's uh, like say or state or switch. There's a whole bunch of things. Yeah, but let's see. Unless they put it in, they didn't tell anybody. Just like oopsie. Uh, let's see. Maybe it's the next one up. Let's see if this works. So some features are experimental. So when you say use experimental, what you're saying is look, use experimental feature. Even in look, even in four dot uh five dot forty, 5 .40. You get this error. So if I were to do Which thought I did uh try something. Wait, I want to get the this example because this says so it says experimental there and i know we're i know we're past eight o'clock um you're fired good okay so that says experimental and according to that dot the document this this should work but it doesn't so that is probably not correct. I'll file a bug. What's the bug? The bug, well, documentation bug. Oh, maybe I'll issue a pull request and I'll get my name in the next Are release. you still talking about the use feature thing? Yeah, like use That's feature. a real thing. Oh, I know it's a real thing. Maybe I should copy and paste this. But look, if I just use use feature class with that ver that version in from the article that's supposed to yeah, because ex the use experimental is a subset of use feature for experimental features. That's that's what I can tell right now. All right, let's try this. Uh, I should call it poop. I was thinking Perl object oriented programming. 
<laughs> All right. Oh uh, Lord. Oh, okay. Well, I guess that works. I, I guess I, I need to go and understand the difference. I don't use any of these experimental things or built-in things or anything, so I don't have any explanation for how all of that crap works. New errors. I won't go over all those since we're at the end, but there's new errors in here. We should. I I really want to make this a regular thing that we go over. Um, even if even if Muhammad doesn't write an article, uh, we can always just go through the pro the pro delta for each major version or each each re release. Not made, whatever major means, I don't know. So what is this? Oh, that's crazy. Okay. That's just some weird eval thing there. Um, oh, that's an eval of some bad code, I guess. All right, new warnings, changes to existing diagnostics, figure micro pearl, long broken. It's been removed as promised. In Pearl 5.18, okay, micro pearl. Rest in peace. Uh, oh yeah, I think this is causing is micro problems. pearl. I, I think it was like a something that you, it was used to boots to get bootstrapped. Uh, the, a or, smaller pearl for simple tasks. Might just be a subset. Wasn't there like not quite Pearl <coughs> NQP or is that still using Raku? That's that's a, a subset of Raku and not related to Pearl. It's a badly, it's another misnomer from the Pearl 6 thing. It should not be called yeah. NQP. It should be called NQR. So apparently Micro Pearl was the guy trying to delete a whole bunch of unused parts of Pearl, which actually is a... Not a bad idea because Perl is bloatware, as we can see, looking through all this crap that even us professional Perl programmers have never heard of. Um, platform notes, Serenity OS. What is that? It's like Haiku. I don't know. Let's see what it is. Twenty eighteen. Is it Linux? Unix Lite. BSD. It has its own kernel. Huh, so it's a standalone hobbyist project. Cool. So Serenity is not Linux, which is not right. Heard GNU. <laughs> it's it's not Something. GNU either. Yeah. Well, that's super cool. It does kind of look like it looks haiku ish. Temple OS. If you don't know what Temple OS is, that'll blow your mind. Oh, yeah. Rip Terry Davis. Huh? That, guy. that guy is like a mental. He's illness dead. hero he's dead he's like the yeah he's the he's the craziest bestest programmer there ever was well he I think. He, he uh he created his own kernel programming language and operating system based on biblical principles yeah he was uh and a gooey yeah he felt like and i i mean Far be oh, he got me. it all from God, programmed directly into Far his brain. Far be it from me to to say whether or not he really was, but he he said he was he would talk to communicate with God through his programming and his operating system. But unfortunately, he yeah he was uh, he went off. He to was grid mentally and, ill. He went off grid, and uh, they, I don't know the circumstances in which he found them dead, but it was it was pretty sad. I mean, yes, you, that you is hate, very sad. You hate seeing the decline of somebody like that. Well, imagine what he could have done if he had applied himself to Pearl or something. Oh, yeah. Maybe we'd have some crazy good guys in charge instead of some crazy bad guys in charge. You read my Any mind. minute now. Anyway, don't I don't want anyone to see me without my beard so they can't recognize that I'm actually that guy. Yeah. Oh, I can see it. 
I can see it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's better better to be that guy than like say uh, Hans Reiser, you know. <laughs> Dude, we actually thought that he was innocent because I was on the JFS team at IBM when the Reiser thing hit, oh, and wow. we we like we had communicated with him, like because uh, we were we were creating a competing product, right? We were both creating journaling file systems for the Linux kernel, uh-huh. but we also wanted to, you know, I mean, it's just like the, the BSD and Linux people probably talk to each other once in a while, you know, whatever you, you're not totally rivals. You're also somewhat cooperative as well. So I know that my team had communicated with him about some stuff and we were very sympathetic towards him. Sure, I mean in the beginning. Yeah. Well, you want to uh, you want to assume somebody's innocent. You know? Yes, until he Especially, started totally being crazy and admitting to being a murderer. So yeah, yeah. that was when we were like, "Oh, we don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> this is a different journaling file system." And it was, you know, that was the end of his project, right? So yeah, in fact, recently there was. He communicated from jail. I saw somewhere like on Colonel. Really? Where he, uh, it was in response to them wanting to remove support for Riser. Oh. And yeah. he was like, yeah, do it. Go for it. I mean, he said he actually took the opportunity to, um, you know, for, like say he was sorry for what he did and all this stuff. But, anyway, oh, it's boy. online. It's online. He could have been, he could have been a, a big star. Mm -hmm. he he was a big star like our we felt like this was the feeling like ibm is legitimately competing against one dude (laughs) it's like (laughs) oh my gosh we're like the biggest company in the world and he's one dude that's kind of like what we felt like like oh man he's better than us don't like like crazy don't admit it but you know he's he's out doing we were trying to port some crappy code from it had originally been in in Irix, and then it had gotten totally crapped up when they tried to get it to work in OS2 Warp. And then we were like, we were on the third port to get it into Linux. And of course, nobody nobody was successful because EXT4 came out and just deleted it. Why would you want to use anything else if there's a new EXT3 or 4 that can do it automatically? I think 3 was the one at that point that had yeah. come out with journaling at the time. Yeah. So it it, it kind of destroyed everybody else at that point. So, but yeah, I, I did contribute code, some code to uh, kernel utilities for JFS way back in the day. And nice. that was one of my early claim to fame things. So cool. All right. Uh, probably wrap it up here, but the uh, plas- pla- platform specific notes. Uh there is a new, uh, um, what do you call it? The Windows Pearl thing. Strawberry Pearl? Strawberry, yeah. Somebody just released Strawberry 5.40. It like just four... got announced today on our group. Ooh, okay. One page shows 5.4, uh, one Strawberry Pearl. Oh, nice. Okay. You know, they, they, uh, they had stopped, put it out, because I think it was just a it had got become a huge burden and then they put a tremendous amount of effort to, to get it to 38. And I think a lot of that work was to make it easier to keep up Yes. with the upstream. So it's nice to see that they've, uh, but that's nice. It is very nice. Very cool. Very cool. Um, where's the pro Delta. Okay. Linux, Mac, VMS, Oracle, Oracle Linux. Okay, internal changes. Uh, all Greek to me. Selected bug fixes. Tyler, if anything, can y'all read that or is it too small? Yeah, but I don't think any of this will probably matter. I guess it's this is this is what they pay I, Dave Mitchell twenty thousand dollars every six months or yeah. every three months or whatever it is. To fix all of this obscure stuff that no one will ever know about. I think this on um so I'm on like one of the University of Texas supercomputers, Frontera. Like whenever I start up run Pearl, it's um 
gives all that spew about the LC, the locale set settings. Oh, and then, okay. And then if I run, if I run the, so it's like, it doesn't get it. I don't know. It's something to do with the environment. And I'm not sure if it's exactly correlated, but I'll have to go back and see if this fixes it. Uh, because mm. I've been back and forth with their support and they can't reproduce it. Even if they log in as me or what? Yeah. So it's maybe something that your terminal emulator is causing. Oh, uh, it's I mean that's that could possibly be. Could I don't I, know how locales work. I, I will tell you. It right could now. be I, that actually could be. Because that that's like the one I didn't even consider that. That's check like your term thing. um um environmental variable when yeah. you log in, or even just better, just type set and dump it all out to a file or set sort and dump it out to a file and then have them do a set sort and dump it to a file and then do a diff between those two files and, and especially looking but for term but any other environmental variables that are different yeah good call that's what i would do good call yeah it's the weirdest thing it happens just one on that one machine for me yeah that's yeah I'll weird. look i'll look i'll look into that okay um let's give a shout out to everybody who contributed Hey, uh, Zachy contributed. That's cool. Um, let's see. Watch the usual names. I think that uh, Zachy, this might not be the first time he's gotten his name in here. Here's Yves. No, I don't think it is. Yves. Do you know Benjamin McMahon? From cPanel? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I know him. Um, he was one of the most active members all last year, even up to yeah, January he, of this so, year. Remember when we did that, uh, the, the the one about, um, you know, contracting or whatever? Um, I drove into I drove into the city to to sit at cPanel, and like Julian was there, Brian was was there. And then Brian was also at the conference. Brian? I'm sorry, Benjamin. Jonathan, uh, Benjamin McMahon. Benjamin, Benjamin was, was there at cPanel when we did that. Okay. That uh, Perlmonger's talk. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. It was the GUI one. It was the GUI one. You were on that one too. It was the one where we were talking about GUIs. WX widgets. But Benjamin was there at cPanel. And then he was at the Pro Conference in Toronto. So he tried. Oh, I must he, have missed you, him at that. You may, conference. you may even have met him. You didn't know. I probably did because I met a ton of people at the table when we were. Yeah, he he, he would have people. come by um, and, and seen what you were doing there. So. Um, Almost certainly. Cool. All right. Well, I guess yeah. I think that's probably about as good coverage as as uh, anybody has done anywhere in the entire world. See, I'm I'm trying to promote also the Pearl Five Forty. Okay. Uh, no, we need to just have people come over to Rust. Me and Evan, we're starting a new Rust to Pearl group, and me and Gabor, we're going to start a new Pearl to uh, well, whatever. What's he? He supports Rust or Go or something as well. I forget. I forget to, but the, uh, I keep trying to tell Evan and anybody is listening to this. I really think it's a good idea to try and write a mini Pearl or maybe even a micro Pearl interpreter in Rust. So when I'm not going to do that, when, good Lord, when Rust people like Evan come over and try and pull people away, uh, I, I, I say, you know, do something, do something that would actually help the Pearl community. Cause honestly, I don't, I don't see, I don't believe that uh, Pearl and Rust are like are mutually exclusive. Yeah. But like, you realize that by saying what you just said, that it would require Rust to run Pearl. Right. And that so, would suck. <laughs> but it would also be kind of neat to have an alternative interpreter and it would get, Rust people involved in Pearl, Pearl people able to look at Pearl and Rust, 
if they so choose. So it's not really it's not really a troll suggestion. I think it's a legitimate would be a legitimately interesting I'm thing to see. Putting that under trolling. Okay, I gotta go. My wife just came back, <laughs> but uh I will send this list of all of the active uh people so you can go through that. All right. Well, uh thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, John, everybody, everybody watching in the future. I will close out.